All right. Welcome to the Fortify Your Data podcast. I am here with Grant Elliott uh, of Astendio, which is an integrative cybersecurity and risk management platform. I had uh, actually gotten connected to him because he had a webinar with our friends at Maloney Novotny. Dale Dresch, uh, my favorite auditor on planet Earth, was uh, chatting with him. And I'm like, man, this is actually uh, really pertinent to a lot of the issues that I'm facing kind of in my SaaS world. And uh, he's a good speaker. So let's see if uh, I can get him on. And he was uh, gracious enough to give me a little bit of his time. So Grant, if you want to give a little bit of an intro for yourself and your company, and we'll get rolling. Well, thank you for the invitation, Michael, and for uh, giving me some time. And nice to know we have a man crush on the same person. Uh, we love Dale as well. Uh, he's uh, been a really great partner for us. Uh, as you said, um, I'm the uh, CEO and chairman of a company called Estendio. We're an eight-year-old a cybersecurity firm. Um, we focus on uh, the, the general areas integrated risk management, but we, we feel that we do a little bit more than that. And so you can explain to, um, I guess, your listeners what that does is we're a SaaS platform that helps organizations uh, build out their security program, uh, operate it on a day-to-day -day basis, and then allow them to demonstrate and showcase that to whatever stakeholders. So uh, the reason we uh, interact with Dale was because um, Maloney and Novotny are a partner of ours and, and they use our platform to audit their clients. Um, we've built, I've been running the organization for about eight years and we started initially really focusing on the kind of managed aspect of that. A lot of typical GRC platforms or IRM platforms. Um, they focus really on a kind of creating a, 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 a platform on the side where you export data into it. Uh, my background is a former uh, Chief Information Security Officer and Chief Operations Officer meant that you know some of the challenges I was experiencing in that role wasn't simply just negotiating the audit. It was the kind of day-to-day -day management of the activities, the tasks that had to be operated in order to kind of meet those security standards. And then when it came to the time of audit, being able to have all that evidence to be able to demonstrate or display to the auditor. And so, uh, it, you know, I was always <laughs> amazed that uh, the tools that were in the marketplace didn't really address that issue. Uh, we were in the age of Salesforce and HubSpot and you know all these cloud applications that did this great job transforming sort of mundane processes. And it always surprised me that there was no platform in the marketplace that kind of did this. So I like to say we're the kind of Salesforce for security. Um, you know, our platform's not going to make you secure in the same way that Salesforce doesn't sell for you. But if you use our platform, uh, you're going to be much more and uh, much better organized uh, and, and much more effective in building and operating your security program and being able to negotiate your audits. That's great. And that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, obviously, I, I believe that in a previous life, Dale audited me and he must have used your platform. But did you, so did you start knowing that you were going to make that platform or did you initially start just doing cybersecurity services? Um, no, I think the idea was always that, you know, how do we simplify this? I, I used to have an old manager that used to say to me, um, you know, he was the first person I ever worked with in my career that was younger than me. So he was a kind of really smart guy. And he said to me, Grant, he goes, always hire smart, lazy people. And I, I kind of looked at him quizzically, right, thinking, is he, is he referring to me when he said this? Because he just offered me a job. And, um, and I said, you know, can you explain that? And he said, well, clearly you don't want to hire you know, lazy, not smart people, he says. He said, and don't get me wrong, he said, you know, smart, uh, hardworking people are great as well. They work really hard and they get a lot of things done, he said. But the great thing about smart, lazy people is you give them something to do or they'll look at a problem and think, you know, there really must be an easier way to make that happen. And so maybe I, I fell into that trait a little bit more than, than, than I thought I did at the time. And, you know, when I was, again, as I mentioned, the chief information security officer, and I was spending all these late nights, you know, doing all the preparation, chasing up all the information, I kept thinking, look, there has to be a better way. There, this cannot be, why isn't there a platform that allows me to store and manage this? So when I left that organization, it was purely with the mindset of, okay, how do we create some sort of like tech company, some sort of uh, software platform that addresses that specific problem? And I think what made it a slightly different perspective for me was I was the chief operations officer as well as the chief information security officer. So I wasn't just focused on getting secure or I wasn't simply just focused on, you know, the end result of passing an audit. 
I had to find a way that from a day-to-day -day operational perspective with a minimum set of resources, we could actually maintain on an, an ongoing basis um, the kind of security posture that we needed to uh, um, you know, all along, right? And so not just for the audit. And so I think that's why I came at it from a slightly different perspective because I had both those roles. But the idea certainly from the beginning was, no, we, we're a platform company. We need to provide a platform tool. We do provide services on top, but again, mainly for the purposes of helping our clients understand what to do, how to set up the platform and maintain the platform. But, you know, the great thing about technology today, it really is an enabler to make an organization more efficient if it's implemented the correct way. Yeah, and that kind of leads into my next question. So one of the... Um... So, so I used to how Dale, Dale and I met, uh, I was, I was at a data center and we had a lot of different, um, environments that we were hosting within the data center, um, similar to kind of like a rack space model maybe. And, um, we always needed like the auditor needed to not be the person solving the problems, at least in our world. So are you kind of doing a little bit of that or how do you choose when, you are acknowledging some problems and you say, hey, this is something we can help you with, or hey, we're pointing this out. Maybe you should go somewhere else though, because this is this might be a conflict of interest. Do you run into that? Absolutely. I mean, I think, and it's a common misconception I think that clients have, and understandably so. Um, if they're going to be audited, it's, it's common for them to reach out to an auditor and sort of like think the auditor is going to guide them through the audit process. And they're, look, the auditors are, are, are people that are experienced and there's certain guidance that they can offer. Um, but what they can't do is they can't do it for you. And I think the mistake a lot of organizations uh, make is that they, they, they approach the auditor uh, thinking they're further on than they actually are and that the auditor is going to guide them through the process. We, you know, we, we divide this in between what we call preparation or advisory and then the audit itself. And so um, certain organizations like AICPA, which is the, uh, the, 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 the uh, CPA's kind of authority, they have a, 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 an ethics, a set of ethics and rules that specifically stipulate uh, around how an auditor's uh, able to behave. And, you know, Dale can explain this a lot better than I can, but it, it makes it very clear that there's a, a real line between how much work the auditor can do for you on, on your behalf before they become, they, they stop becoming independent. And, you know, it's a bit like, you know, you can't have your examiner teach you, right, at school, right? They have to be independent. There's a reason that we do independent examinations as well. So our organization, we, uh, our platform uh, is seen as an extension of the, of the client. We act as an organization, as an extension of the client. And so we will uh, help the client prepare. And because we understand and we've worked with lots of audit firms, and we, I think we, we supported over uh, a thousand audit assessments last year, right? We understand what it takes to be prepared for these types of audits. And because we're an extension of the client, we can help guide the client through that process in a way that allows them to feel that when they're ready to go through the audit. And um, when oftentimes we have clients that are approaching us uh, and we will ask them very often how mature do they think the security program actually is and how ready do they think they are for an audit. And more often than not, they'll say they think that they'll be 80, 85 percent in the way they are. And that's understandable because one of the big misconceptions I think a lot of organizations make is they, uh, they assume that they've been audited on their technical sophistication and we support a lot of technology enabled companies without appreciating just how much procedural and administrative work is involved in an audit. And by the time we've done a gap analysis uh, on their, 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 their readiness for an audit, oftentimes they're as far back as 15 to 20% ready because they will have quite sophisticated technologies but they won't have all the procedures and administration around those technologies. And when you're going through an audit, one of the first things an auditor is going to come in and audit you against is, okay, in order for me to, 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 to audit you against what you say you do, you need to show me what you say you do, right? In order for you to demonstrate that you're doing what you say you do, you have to have written down um, that you say you've done it. And then you have to give me evidence that shows me that you've been doing it against what you say. And a lot of these organizations, you know, they're doing a lot of things intuitively, uh, but they're not writing down why they're doing it. Maybe they've, you know, they've deployed their, their services in AWS, which is a, you know, a smart thing to do because it's a big infrastructure. They're encrypting their, their, their laptops. They've done a lot of common sense things, but they haven't done that as part of a written down strategy for what they should be doing. And then that means it's, it's kind of more ad hoc rather than, de than deliberate and planned. And, and that's going to uh, cause a red flag in that way. 
So do you think that, um, so obviously you guys are handling all sorts of audits. Do you find one is particularly challenging in that regard? Or do you think that they're all just their own kind of animal that are of equal significance and difficulty? Well, it's a great question, actually, because there are lots of different uh, audit types out there. Uh, obviously, we focus a lot on security and privacy. Um, but really, this comes down to um, an organization. We often find when we ask organizations why they're looking to go through a particular uh, order or framework, oftentimes it's, it's not necessarily for the right reasons, right? Maybe it's their customers asked for it or uh, they've heard that it's a good idea or they've heard about it. Or maybe they're oftentimes we hear the executive team thinks it's going to be a good marketing initiative. Um, what typically happens when we go through the preparation with them or we start having a conversation with them, we clarify with them just how much work's involved. I mean, you know, for, for your listeners, if you want to go through some sort of formal third party security audit, you, you know, all said and done, you're not going to get much change out of $100,000. And that's a kind of big dis disconnect between what most organizations think. They, they, they will maybe find an audit firm that will quote them $15,000, dollars $20,000 um, uh, to conduct the audit. And, and that's very low end. And, and, and to be honest, most auditors can't do the, the, the right level of work for that amount of money, right? If you just divide the number of hours and a reasonable hourly rate. But that doesn't take into account the preparation work that the organization has to take. It doesn't take into account the kind of tools and technologies that an organization has to make sure they're implementing in order to meet their security profile as well. So when we have a, an initial conversation with a client and we basically say to them, look, you know, I want you to think about this now instead of a $10,000 decision, a $100,000 decision, right? And, you know, and maybe that's over a year, two years, right? Now start thinking about why do you really want to do it? And all of a sudden, the concept of a marketing initiative goes out the door because they're not going to spend $100,000 on, on marketing, right? Um, so now it comes down to, okay, well, our customers are suggesting it, but maybe easier for us to win contracts if we have it. Well, you again go back to the $100,000. Are, are they demanding it, insisting that they will not contract with you uh, without this? Or are they saying it would be easier to contract? Because if it's easier to be contracting, and then the next thing comes down to, well, how how robust is their procure is your your customer's procurement process? Because what are, are a lot of organisations start figuring out is, you know, I could go through a hundred thousand dollar audit process, or I could just tell my my customer that I'm secure. I could fill out their vendor security assessment, which basically says. You know, for all intents and purposes, are you secure? Well, yes, right? <laughs> and we're good. And it's not that people are trying to be disingenuous or trying to be dishonest in that process, but most times vendor security assessments are just really not an effective way of, of, of ascertaining whether uh, your vendor's secure, right? You know, you start asking a question like, you know, are your servers encrypted, right? I have one server that's encrypted. Yes, right? Well, and, then what, and to what degree is it encrypted, right? <laughs> exactly, right. So you tend to find that, you know, um, without someone coming in and verifying, right, that someone is doing what they say they're doing. And that becomes, if you're if you're a large organization and you have, you know, hundreds of vendors, your ability to do that level of scrutiny or due diligence on every single vendor is, is really hard. It's time consuming. So most large organizations don't have the time or the bandwidth to do that. Uh, so they ask questions and then they try and pick out exceptions. Really, the best way to do it is to make sure that, again, you've defined what type of framework do you think your, 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 your vendor should go through, uh, and then you, you require them to go through that. And then you validate and verify some of that as well. Uh, but that's really the, kind of the way that most organizations should do it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm curious, when you're working with people, are you primarily working with people that are performing the audits then? Or are you working with people that are being audited? What is your um, most common, I guess, interaction? Yeah, so I, I think look, we started off predominantly and we still see ourselves as the champion for the organization being audited, right? Um, we represent them. We are there to support and advise them. Our platform is broadly used by them. But the way we've designed the platform is we've realized that, look, it's not just one or the other, right? If you look at and you analyze the market in terms of how the market typically supports them, you've got a whole bunch of services out there that are trying to uh, support, uh, again, the, the organization itself that's being audited and they provide various different tools to do that. Well, that's great, but un unfortunately, when they want to work with the auditor, the auditor have their own set of tools so yeah, you've built all this evidence potentially, you've done a really good job collecting it. Now you have to export all this information into a third party audit platform. And that does two things. One, it's just incredibly time consuming to do that. Uh, and and the, the structure of the data may or may not be right. 
And secondly, it decapitates the data, right? So all of a sudden now, you know, a spreadsheet that's been sent over is not as trustworthy as, you know, linking into someone's direct logs. So, so that the audit firms obviously need to have that data and need to review the data in a, in a structured way. You go to the audit firms themselves, and again, they are understandably have those systems to make their process uh, easier, but that doesn't make their clients process easy because again, they're having to send that. So we've developed a platform that serves both, right? The, the same platform that is the one that's used by organizations to build, operate, and showcase their security programs that they're using on a day-to-day -day basis, collecting and managing the data. They're using that, they're in that platform every day. This is the platform that makes them operate that in a more efficient manner. But the same platform is one that the audit uh, partner has. They pay for us for a version of their own platform. And then what can happen is they can create a trusted connection between the two. They can now create requirements on their, their client to basically say, I want you to share this type of information in a structured format. And then the nice thing about the way we do that is that the, uh, the auditor never has to leave their version of the platform. And the client never has to leave their version of the problem. Everyone just does everything within their own version. And then they can simply link to the correct data. So instead of basically uploading a policy document and then trying to provide evidence that, yeah, that policy document has been distributed to my entire organization, it's been approved by appropriate management, uh, and it's been, you know, it's easily accessible to all employees. Um, they simply just link to that policy document within our platform and the auditor can click through and it actually can see all the logs, all the previous versions, can see all the acknowledgements, can see all the approvals and can see all the views of that particular document without ever all the clients had to do is simply point to that policy against that particular control and the auditor has all that metadata around the policy as opposed to just uploading it an individual policy and trying to answer all those different questions. And the same goes for training, it seems goes for all the kind of typical audit tasks, for asset information, for you know, all of that information, again, is, a, is, is simply linked. And then you, what you're doing is you're authorizing your auditor the ability to access the metadata around that. And so it simplifies the process with both parties. You as an individual organization, it's easier for you to have to duplicate any information, you just point to it. And for the auditor, they have all their information structured, it's all real time, it's all up to date, and it's, it's, it's more enhanced in terms of the, the metadata associated with it. So it really serves both parties very, very well. That's fascinating. Yeah, I think that was the one thing that when I was like looking up the software and the platform, I'm like, well, is it, who is this for? Because I know you had Dale and Dale's clearly using it, but then it also looked like there was some sort of company being audited platform. But the answer is it is both. It is both. So. Yeah, and look, the challenge here, and this is the kind of challenge that I kind of stumbled across, was that, look, security cuts across all aspects of the business as well, right? So we also see this within the marketplace, right? I see risk management solutions that are out there that help you kind of manage the risk management process. I see vendor management solutions out there that help you manage and address vendors. I see asset management solutions there. But the reality is, if you think about what security is all about, it's about understanding what data do you have, where is that data, who has access to that data and how are you ultimately protecting that information, right? And again, your data that you have as an organization isn't just contained within your organization, it's contained within your partners and your vendors as well. So it doesn't make sense for you to simply have five or six different systems to manage all these different elements, right? Because now you've got this problem of making these systems talk together. So our platform serves multiple people. That's why we talk about what we call the MyVCM Trust Network, right? If you're part of the Trust Network community, you have a platform that allows you to manage all of your own data but also interact and create trusted connections with other stakeholders within your ecosystem and share appropriate trust information or security information as appropriate all within you know, your own instance. Yeah, I think that's huge, right? I, when you're dealing with uh, with security, right? I think that more and more the, li the, the lines between what's physical security and cybersecurity kind of blend, it gets very difficult to like explain to somebody why they need it. Even though it's one of the most crucial things. So I guess my question to you is, in your journeys convincing people to protect their data, what seems to be the hardest thing to get across? And, and for example, um, for me, it wasn't necessarily like you need a firewall or what are you doing to protect your data? It's like if you are being hacked today, do you have any ways of knowing, right? That seemed to be a concept that's very difficult for maybe not like a CIO, but like an IT manager to grasp in a lot of senses. So do you find yourself in these situations where you're trying to like define what, 
why they need cybersecurity? And if so, what are the areas that people seem to care about least? So I think the first thing that organizations or people need to do is take a step back because, you know, I, I used to run a lot and, and when I, you know, get quite serious about my running and I started getting to kind of running clubs, I was always interested and in, in when they, the first thing they said is you need to learn how to run, right? And I thought, well, hold on, I've been running all my life. And they said, yeah, no, you've been, you've been running, but you need to learn how to run, right? And they talk about form, they talk about technique, they talk about how, you know, footsteps, et cetera. They basically take you a step back and, and realize and say, yeah, you've been doing what you call running, right? But you've not been efficiently running. It's the same when we talk about security, right? There's a lot of things that organizations just do intuitively, right? We all know that today that we should be encrypting our laptops and encrypting our data. We all know that we should be communicating with each other through an encrypted uh, connection, right? We know that we should be securing our passwords. Increasingly, we know that we should do uh, multi-factor authentication. There's lots of things we inherently know we do. And especially if you're an IT person, Again, you straight away go into these kind of IT controls that you think you should do. But that is not your objective. Your objective is not to implement technology. Your objective is not to implement uh, cybersecurity tools, right? Your objective is to understand risk, right? What you're trying to understand is, what is my risk of some form of breach or some form of you know, a, 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 a security impact? And that, that might be people accessing information. It might be uh, the availability of information, just, you know, ransomware is not just about uh, accessing data, it's about uh, removing access to data as well. So when you start re-educating people about this is about risk management and understanding your risk and how you basically invest your money into risk, you start realizing that some of the decisions that a lot of organizations take today are not really risk-based, right? You see organizations, I see uh, CIOs, CSOs of organizations, you know, investing millions of dollars, right, on the their, their, their latest um, I don't know, uh, 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 DOP technology or, or log management tools, et cetera. But they're not training their staff effectively to prevent against, uh, you know, uh, ransomware attacks, right? You take the Colonial Pipeline incident, right? Um, now, you would think that an organization that large with the security budget as much as they have would have implemented multi-factor authentication within their organization because fundamentally, if they'd done that, that entire breach would not have happened, right? That whole breach came from the fact that the ransomware attackers were able to get through a single password and access into their system, right? And so when you, you know, it's a bit like, you know, when you buy a house and you spend money on a really, really secure alarm system, but either you don't train people how to use it or you don't lock your doors, it doesn't matter how much money you spend on cybersecurity capabilities. If you're not understanding your risk profile, if you're not understanding where the biggest likelihood of a risk is going to come from and then investing in those higher risk areas, you're not going to have an effective security program. And so that's kind of really the kind of biggest re-education we have with some of our clients is understanding, okay, what are you trying to achieve? Now also understand that you're never going to completely remove risk, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the whole concept of prevention, it's then about, okay, I mean, literally the first steps that you take after some sort of incident happens has a significant impact on the impact that that, uh, that incident is going to have on you as well. So your ability to immediately respond to an incident is just as important as your ability to prevent that incident from happening in the first place as well. So that's the kind of re-education. It's kind of step back and let's really think about security in a different light. Let's think about security from a risk perspective in terms of what is your biggest risk. And then once you understand where your risks are, it makes the decision about investing dollars a, a, a much easier risk. You only have so many dollars you can invest and you're going to put them in the areas that have the biggest risk impact for you. Yeah, I guess it's a little disheartening because that's it's very much the same conversation we've been having for a while on cybersecurity, right? Like all of your employees are your biggest risks and you know you can only silo people to some extent or not give people access to maybe some of the more pertinent information. But it seems to me that that seems it's where it's gone. It hasn't gone into, or the industry hasn't gone into um, safeguarding or re-educating people and using their equipment better. It's gone into siloing those people and mitigating who has access to what. As you look at like the cybersecurity industry as a whole, what kind of trends do you think are going to pop up in the next like three years that you see from your unique perspective being more focused on like the audit side of things? Yeah, so I think, look, we, we've evolved a long way from the days where we used perimeter security as a mechanism to save our organizations. It used to be that, you know, um, you know, we would create a network right, and we'd keep the bad guys out. We'd kind of use a castle and remote mechanism to protect. And as long as um, we believed that there were only trusted actors inside the castle, then everything was okay, right? 
Well, you know, the days of those traditional networks are gone, right? Really, it's really only for the most part, your Fortune 1000 customers that really have what we used to consider a traditional LAN or LAN environment. More and more organizations, especially this whole mid section uh, 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 of businesses, the whole mid market, they're moving to cloud based services, right? Their, their infrastructures in AWS or, or, or Microsoft Azure, uh, they're using cloud based uh, um, services like, you know, Gusto for, 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 for HR or, or HR Bamboo. Or, so there's, there's so many of them. They're using Salesforce, they're using HubSpot, right? Even for email and communication, they're using Slack and, 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 and Office 365 or, 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 or Google uh, um, uh, work. And um, so we've moved to this cloud-based environment. And so when you think about the whole idea of, you know, protecting data in a single place, I mean, the whole construct of the concept of what data actually is, is fundamentally changed. We no longer think about data now as being a single element of that data. The concept of data ownership is even becoming a debatable issue because if you think about how many uh, 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 duplicate versions of data exist all across the place. So the question is, you can't provide a kind, of, a kind of perimeter view of security. And then kind of take this whole concept one step further when we look at what's happening with, um, you know, since COVID-19 pandemic, now employees are spread to the wind. So you can't even say, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll restrict access to people within a physical environment. So we know our data is in different places, but as long as people are accessing it from a fixed location, we can protect it that way. Well, that's no longer an issue either, because right? now we're having to build a world where your employees can be anywhere. They're at home, they're at work, they're on holiday, who knows where they're. They might not even be in the country, right? You really don't know they can be literally anywhere. And so we have to think about how we protect data less on a physical perspective and more an identity perspective, right? So do I know who you are, right? Do I trust you? What do I trust you to do with my data, right? And so it comes back to the same tenets I mentioned before, right? You need to know what data you have, right? And, you know, and the severity of that data. You need to know where that data is or can be, right? You need to know who has access or should have access to that data and how they're supposed to use it. And you basically build protective layers around those key components. And, and that becomes far more administrative, right? And there, look, the, the, the tools that are out in the marketplace to now have never been better, right? You know, I remember 15 years ago, just encrypting a laptop was expensive. Now most laptops come encrypted, right? Uh, you look at the ability to create encrypted communications, look at all the third party services and their, 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 their levels of security. But by the same token, we're now trusting all these different parties. And the question for us becomes, how are we ensuring that all these different suppliers and all these different entities we're using, how are we ensuring that they themselves? Uh, a good example, obviously, at this time last year was Zoom, right? Who obviously were attacked. Again, we have a large scale organization, venture backed, who basically had a pretty remedial cyber attack conducted on them, right? And it's kind of security issues where they, they basically weren't encrypting set data. How does an organization get there because there's not the outside pressure on them to basically, again, ensure. So what we're seeing and what I'm seeing is, you know, and the reason that, you know, you, you bring it back to Dale again, if you look at the number of uh, the significant increase in the audit firms that are appearing in the US, it's because more and more organizations are realizing there is no way as a large organization, I can sufficiently address all the vulnerabilities that my vendors might have. So what I need to do is I need to set a standard I need to require the organization to go through some sort of independently verified audit against that standard. And that's the best way for me to know that an organization. So what we're seeing is as a result of all of this is large organizations starting to realize, I can't do this myself. I require an independent entity to do this. And that will eventually, hopefully start forcing more organizations uh, to pay more than lip service to, to, to the security framework or process to have in place and actually start going through a, a legitimate audit. Yeah, I, I think that you have probably one of the cleanest perspectives on it that I've heard. You know, I think a lot of people kind of have more of a shotgun approach, but that's very holistic. Um, do you have any advice from your vantage? So I, I, before I ask that, did you always know that you were going to basically do what you're doing today? Maybe not the exact company, but did you know you're going to be running this type of company or you're going to be solving this kind of issue? And if not, are you shaking your head? At what yeah, point really? did you realize... And, um, you know, I, I, have, I have young kids at the moment. I've, I, I have a, a kid that's going into uh, uh, his junior year and, and once going into his uh, 
sophomore year. And, you know, being Scottish, it's taken me a long time just to learn those terms, by the way, just to be clear. <laughs> um, and, you know, so we're, we're kind of going through this whole process of college and what they want to do. And, and I think back to when I was at age, I had absolutely no idea, no idea. So, you know, my career has generally been this kind of, I guess, opportunistic uh, series of terms. Um, you know, if I go back to, uh, I was the chief operations officer of a digital health company um, for a number of years. And, and I just remember we, we won this contract where uh, they were going to do a, a, a significant security audit on us. And so my CEO turned to me and said to me, you're the CEO, right? You need to uh, make sure that we're prepared to do this, right? So I thought, okay. And so, you know, I've always had a reasonably technical background, but um yeah, that was really my first serious step into kind of understanding. This is, I guess, you know, 15, 16 years ago, into really what was involved to the degree. So having spent five, six years in that organization going through very uh, significant uh, 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 security audits for some, some very large pharmaceutical organizations, healthcare organizations as well, uh, kind of, it just kind of, again, to that point, the, kind of, the lazy side in me, so I thought there has to be a better way and it's an area I've been interested in for a long time. And so it kind of just naturally evolved to that. Right. Uh, yeah. So that, that, that clears it up a little bit because I find that most of the people in your position didn't plan it. It just sort of happened. But for the people that are planning some sort of to, to I guess, would look up to you and your company and be like, I want to do something similar. What kind of advice do you have generally for entrepreneurship and then also for somebody specifically into cybersecurity? Sure. Well, look, so in terms of the kind of whole looking up thing, I always, I, I never encourage anyone to look up to, uh, to us in the sense that I kind of feel that what we're doing is we're kind of building a bridge over a torrent, a torrential river, right? And, and, and we've still not reached the other side yet. We're still building a bridge. So it's great we're making progress, right? The bridge is getting longer. Uh, but, you know, we're still <laughs> looking down at this kind of torrential thing, thinking, I hope we can get to the other side. Um, you know, the one thing that, when I started Estendio eight years ago, I guess, you know, I, I still marvel at the idea to some degree that, you know, uh, this was simply just a, an idea, right? We didn't take this technology out of another company. Uh, we didn't have a, an existing product or service or, you know, we weren't five people coming together. You know, again, to the point I mentioned in the row, and I just kind of thought, you know, there, there really should be a better way. So I literally one day just wrote down a, a product description said, it'd be really cool if we could build something like this. And I was lucky enough to, you know, no people that could get uh, as part of the initial founding team to kind of help us build that. But I remember telling the story that I tell now eight years ago to investors, to customers, to clients, basically very similar vision. We really haven't pivoted a great deal uh, uh, from a broad strategy perspective. And everyone would say to me at the time, so let's say the conversation we have today, uh, that sounds yeah, phenomenal, that sounds great, it sounds like a great idea, right? But then they would kind of turn away because who is I or who are we to be the ones that realize it's such a huge ambition, right? To try and achieve what we're seeing, building this huge trust ecosystem, right? Um, and when you haven't even got a single client at the time, it's very difficult to persuade people that you're the one that's going to execute that. And so look, we've been on this journey uh, uh, for eight years. We have now hundreds uh, of, of organizations in this trust ecosystem. We have great partners. Uh, like Maloney, not the, Maloney and Devonny. And, and, and now when I tell this story, right, all of a sudden there's a kind of, that's a great idea and you're making progress on that. that. How can we become involved as well? And so it's important to understand that for anyone who's got an idea or got a vision at the beginning, there's going to be lots of people that are, are going to kind of nod their heads to that. The only way you get from here, from, from there to here, is you just have to be really persistent. You have to persevere. You have to faith. And you have to understand that you're going to take, for every three steps forward you take, you're going to take two steps back. But that's okay because, you know, you know you're going to take another three steps forward. And so that's really kind of, for me, the, the, the advice I always give any kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurs. It's a hard journey. Uh, but if you really have passion, if you really have faith in your idea, don't let people put you off because they will, right? Uh, you know, lots of people have ideas. Lots of people want to jump on your ideas. Just really kind of, you know, if you genuinely believe in it, just work really, really hard. And, and, and if you're persistent, you'll make it happen. Yeah, no, that's uh, another eloquent answer. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely somebody I look up to, even though you're building a bridge over a torrential river. <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, that's that's close to our time. I did want to give you a little bit of time to plug anything. If there's um, anywhere you want people to go where they can learn more about it, obviously I'll have your website in the description. But is, are there any like uh, specific blogs or webinars you've had recently or coming up that you want people to tune into? Well, I mean, if people want to listen to uh, to the webinar we just did with Dale, that's on our website. So you can go to our website, which is standard.com and look at our resources and, and by all means, listen to that as well. Uh, if you know people uh, want to speak to our professional services team uh, to just give them con a consultancy or myself on where they are what they want to do we're always happy to do that again we when we started this journey we started with this mission of making uh, security uh, uh, affordable and available to any organization of any size and we're very lucky today we have small startups using our platform we have large multinational enterprises using our platform so we really have a kind of broad spectrum of clients and we really take great pride in the fact that we are what we like to see is we're democratizing security for any organization and making make it making it a, a, a achievable for anyone so yeah by all means uh, you know if you're if you're thinking about going through a SOC audit or some other type of audit go and listen to our webinar with uh, with Dale and, and I'm sure that'll be informative uh, if you're just interested in you know getting more information on security reach out to us and we'd be happy to talk to you Heck yeah, and I'll have all of those uh, and, uh, links and and ways to contact them in the description. And then if you have any additional questions uh, for me or for Grant specifically, I can potentially be the filter. Uh, and you know where to email me if you're listening to this podcast. So uh, Michael at fortifyourdata.com. So again, Grant, I really appreciate your time today. Um, thanks. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed the conversation. Perfect. And that's the podcast. This episode is brought to you by KitCaster. KitCaster books you on top podcasts. How do funded startup founders attract prospects and talent? Podcast interviews. How do entrepreneurs with exits find new deals? Podcast interviews. How do C-suite execs differentiate in crowded markets? Podcast interviews. KitCaster books you on top podcasts. Click the link in the show notes for a special offer. Celebrate good conversation.